Well, um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers, particularly Stephen and Francesco, for inviting me to this uh, meeting. And more so, thanks to you all for staying back. I think weather has, to a certain extent, helped as well. So, um, last of the day, and I think this is a topic where I was asked to give some answers. I don't know whether there are, but what I'm going to do is to present what the evidence is around the topics and the questions that is being there. So, um, this is just a disclosure because of the doctor is a grant holder and then uh, more than that. Now, when we went for lunch, and as you're coming back, uh, mm -hmm. Stephen uh, told that the, the building, this hospital building, it was in 1940. So, and that was the largest building in Sweden at that time. And now it is going through renovation because it is not fit for purpose. To a certain extent, what it looks like, what we are discussing about the ducts. So, yesterday's answers has nothing to do with today's questions because they were right for this study. And I think that the trials that were done um, many years ago in the last 50 years, they were right for that time, but today's uh, questions are probably different. But that does not mean that uh, if we don't know, then we, we, we stop thinking about uh, it is important to ask the right question to discover the right answers. And this is very well you know, seen in this particular um, uh, the compilation of the publications on the PubMed which is going right up to 2017, as you can see here. And if you see, what is happening is, from 1973 until now, there has been a change. So there is a finding treatment for closure of PDA, that was the early way. Then studies evaluating the treatment, whether it is right or not. And I think that was a 2001 publication of a DIP trial, which was at that time became the gold standard, that that's the right way we found the answer. We treat every baby prophylactically and reduces the IVH, and let's go for it. However, it came to a bit of disrepute and uh, in a way because we started questioning the trial as we were treating every single week and we'll talk about that. Then we come to debating the treatments in this phase and now probably we have got to a point of certain degree of confusion and uncertainty and hence have questions whether to treat the PDA or not treat the PDA. And the, the, the most recent bit is that people are shying away from treating the ducts and less and less babies are now treated. However, if you see, there is a version of echocardiography diagnosis of duct from here. Now, it has certainly added to a certain extent about the confusion because we put a probe on the chest, we find a red bit there flowing left to right, and we say there is a duct, we found it. Whether there is a symptom, and we probably got swayed sometime in between here and started treating many babies. And now the repercussion is that we are more into confusion and uncertainty and probably try to learn from what can we do better. So, um, if you look at this, the data which is from 23 to 33 week registration babies, this is the data from 1966 to 69 for the babies who were born and what was their neonatal survival until 27 days among the live births. And this is in 1990 and 94. That's our local data, which is our point uh, leads. And uh, it is interesting to see that between this period, there was a significant increase in survival for the uh, different gestations. We come to the um, Epicure data, which I'm sure you all have come across. Here on the top, it is about 23, 24, 25 week babies, all admitted babies. Between the two cohorts, in the red, it is the um, old, which is 95 cohort, and then it is a 2006 cohort in the green. So you can see at all these gestations, there is an increase in the survival. But if you look at the babies surviving to seven days, it is more or less not changed. So something is happening in the first week uh, where uh, it, it might be important to look into. And one of the questions that comes up is that, yes, there are more babies who are surviving, but what is the morbidity burden? And that is, again, the gap of data between these uh, 10 years apart. Babies treated for atinopathy prematurity increased. And in fact, this number might be even more since we have started relaxing the oxygen saturation targeting after the uh, neoprom collaboration and the boost and the and the support trials. We look at the BPD, that is oxygen dependence at 36 weeks, there is no difference, and abnormality of the cellular ultrasonography. So clearly, there is a problem that we are doing something, more babies are, are surviving, but the burden of the morbidity has not changed particularly. So if we take this uh, very nice study, which is looking at the BPD and the patterns of illness. So there are three patterns overall you can you know, define. The first pattern is where the baby started with an early severe disease and it persisted. BPD risk is about 67% in this group. 
pattern two, they started with early mild disease, with a later progression, they get about 51%. The third pattern is a minimal disease throughout the course and their BPD load is much less. Right? So if you look at the comparison of the different disease profile there, if you see on the left side, which is the pattern one versus three, so one is on the top where it started severe and persistent, and three is at the bottom which is a low profile. You can see at each gestation, the, there's a significant increase in the risk of the BPD. And if you look at the PDA diagnosis here, it has not reached significance, but it is more or less approaching there very close to it, that it doesn't add to it. Even if you compare a pattern two versus three, PDA is coming as a risk factor. So clearly it's a confounder which is sitting there and it cannot be completely parked as we think. So if you just look at the progression as what happens with our PDAs, at birth, very few symptoms because in the first two to three days, you can only diagnose a duct with an echo. Otherwise, clinically, unless it causes pulmonary hemorrhage, it is very unlikely to present you. If this duct persists, it becomes a symptomatic duct anywhere between two, three days to a week or so with a variable hemodynamic effects. Now, that's the time when we are getting the murmurs, we are studying, uh, getting uh, you know, white pulse pressures, or the baby is, is manifesting with the complications uh, with increased ventilation requirements, etc. If it persists, we don't close it, it becomes symptomatic, but it compensates for the effect. So it is sitting there, we have not done anything about it, or we did, but still it is there, and hence, it is uh, symptomatic, but we are quite placid because baby is coming off the ventilation, probably on the CPAP, anything, we can leave it alone, and let's live with that. And at discharge, the duct is there, we call it as a persistent PDA, as we try to follow these babies, and probably go for a final uh, insertion, or a surgical ligation. Having said that, they see medical treatment or surgical treatment at any time, and a proportion of them, they get suddenly closed. It's a very beautiful study which was from Scandinavia, um, and, and what it says is that when the babies were scanned on the uh, day three, and if they were noticed to have a duct present, there was clear cut increase in the risk or the odds of having BPD, necrotizing enterocolitis, and the complications. And as we go into the timeline, clearly babies can have pulmonary hemorrhage, the large duct. They can develop intermediate hemorrhage, neck, chronic lung disease, and mortality. So all of these complications, they have been associated. So clearly, the question about why should we treat PDA, I think there is enough reason, because survival in babies, which are extreme preterm, has improved in the past 40 years, as we see. The proportion of survivors with severe disability has not changed. And babies with PDA, it increased the risk of BPD and other uh, complications of prematurity. With death and other complications of prematurity, they significantly increase in duct and the various studies, they have suggested an increase in odds of or risk of dying from threefold to Shahab Nuri's data of eightfold increase in the death for babies who have a persistent duct. So what can we do about it? And I think in a simplistic view, if you look at what are the different options, one is obviously the conservative treatment, just uh, uh, when you call conservative, I tend to call it as a non-medicinal treatment. We still do something for these babies, whether it's a food restriction or it is about ventilation <coughs> treatment or doing something else, but we are not giving medicine. So yes, it's a non-medicinal treatment, we call it as a conservative treatment. Or uh, babies can be subjected to surgery if we have enough reason for that. Otherwise, we can divide into three strata. The old practice of prophylactic treatment, which was practiced by Laura Ment and uh, Barbara Schmitz, Tipra. And that is, in the first 12 hours, you treat every single baby, irrespective <coughs> of whether we know it's a duct or not. Then it comes as a symptomatic treatment, which is beyond 72 hours, the ducts are symptomatic, or they present with signs and symptoms, we treat them. Third is an evolving approach, which has been a part of trials in the past, but very few, small trials, is early asymptomatic. But it requires the availability of echocardiography, to diagnose a duct and then we can treat it. So hence, echo evolution in the last decade has certainly helped to visit this approach. So um, if, are you switching it off? Yeah. So if just as a part of uh, uh, the integration about the, what is conservative treatment, um, I wonder if what your views are about conservative treatment, fluid restriction, caffeine therapy, 
optimizing respiratory support, and correction of anemia with packed RBC transfusion. They, they, they can do any any option. They can okay. If, if, they, if, if, if you would, uh, want to take all of them, that will be fine. Uh, leave the questions below. You can take one, two, three, or four, depending on what you think is right. You can take one, two, three, four, what would you want? All of them, none of them, everything is right. <coughs> right. Thank you. So you clearly say that the fluid restriction, 89%, um, optimizing respiratory support, again closer to 85%, caffeine therapy, please to see 40%, and correction of anemia, 29%. So um, that is a very interesting and a very good answer, I must say, because um, let's visit one by one the important bit, which is about the fluid restriction. So if we take it on, the fluid restriction, which is conservative treatment, as we have, majority of us have uh, picked it, this is a data which is about uh, uh, the only data, I must say, which is in a small number of babies, where what they did was a 10-day-old baby, uh, and echo done, or uh, babies are more than 10 days old, Echo was done before in 24 hours after fluid restriction from 145 mils per kg on mean to the 108 mils per kg. 18 babies, clearly their mean gestation was 24.8 weeks and 850 grams. What they observed was very interesting. There was no change in the uh, parameters, which you can see on the maximum flow velocity of the duct, um, LA or ratios, mean flow velocity, but it certainly reduced the flow velocity in the superior mesenteric artery, which was significant. And the resistive index in the superior mesenteric artery also increased. So look at the duct diameter, there was no change. And the echo which showed after uh, the, the, the fluid restriction, the superior vena cava flow significantly reduced after this. So what does this mean? We believe that the fluid restriction is a, is a good thing. And as you see, there are 10 day old babies, but clearly it did not change the duct dimension. It only uh, probably exposed the baby to some complications because if your superior mesenteric flow has reduced, you are causing a some degree of ischemia in the presence of the food, which is the substrate. Similarly, the SVC flow has gone down, that is the flow or the blood going to the brain and the upper body has decreased. So that is what is coming. It's the only study so far which is on the, uh, you know, what is the effect of it. Very interesting data. However, if the baby is in a heart failure, clearly it becomes a part of the treatment. I'm not suggesting that that is not a treatment, but routinely to restrict fluid from this data, it does not suggest that it supports it. And hence, it is uh, more or less, uh, uh, rather than going through details, the NSAID treatment and normal fluid intake may prevent renal damage. Because if you look at it, if you restrict the fluid and you give a COX inhibitor to these babies, what is going to happen is there is already a decreased flow to the kidneys and you are also going to cause further complications by increasing the, uh, uh, the, the, the risk of the injury. And hence, now the, the dictum is you know, maintain the normal fluid intake, but if the baby goes anuric or um, there is renal function change, then clearly you take an action. Concomitant use of diuretics is useless and even contraindicated. When hemodynamic significant PDA uh, is there, uh, as I mentioned, no restriction. However, as I said, if the baby is symptomatic in failure, then it becomes a part of the treatment. So that was, uh, I've not touched because caffeine uh, <coughs> at the time was allow me to go into taste, but the CAP trial reduced the, uh, the, the number of babies which require treatment for the duct or surgical treatment. So caffeine indirectly has helped to a certain extent the, uh, the duct. Uh, packed RG transfusion, optimizing hemoglobin, it certainly helps. So you are all right in there that uh, it is helpful. The respiratory support, again, increasing the beep or reduce the shunting volume, but not necessarily the dimension of the duct. If you look at the second approach, which is the prophylactic approach, right? We talked about the prophylactic endomethacin. Large number of babies, 19 trials. Certainly, uh, half the babies who had a symptomatic duct. 
it uh, reduced the babies who require surgical ligation. Severe IVH, it reduced because the role of endometrism is from the initial study that it reduces the IVH. It may not be a direct consequence of the PDA uh, closure. Mortality, there was no change as you can see, and death on uh, disability, there was no change. And only last week uh, at our, you know, the medicine conference, we were having this kind of discussion where Roger Saul, who is into the Cochrane Review, um, you know, the uh, chief for neonatal, he was presenting on the um, data on the ducts. And, and we had uh, a discussion about what should we be meet, uh, take message from here. And Dr. Neil Marlowe was there in the uh, faculty as well. The discussion went, went and it was, uh, outcome at two years should be linked with what is we are doing in the first day of life. And I think that jury is out and I think there is some swaying of the info, the decision making that should we be taking the outcomes at two years and five years linked with what we have done in the first day of life because a lot of water flows into it. But so far this uh, is important finding that there is no change or no improvement in developmental outcome. Bioprofen prophylaxis, yes, uh, again very uh, uh, few trials have been there. And uh, it's about 800 or something, yeah. So uh, if you look in the in, in this, there is clearly a reduction in the presence of PDA on day three of life. The ibuprofen prophylaxis does not reduce the IVH because it was not an effect related to the duct, but it was only seen with endometrism. If you look at the paracetamol, a drug which is again coming into um, clinical practice, and uh, some of you might be using, I don't know. But that is one study where uh, there, there were babies who were uh, a small number, as you can see, 23 and 25, randomized as a treatment uh, with either placebo or, or paracetamol. And what you see is uh, the outcomes in here, the, 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 the echo done before and the echo done after for the paracetamol group and the placebo group. The duct caliber 1.57 to 0.73, it reduces. LAO ratio, there is no change. Uh, and the diuresis, uh, uh, they, they didn't reach significance and sodium again no change. But if you see the time to closure, the only difference was seen is that they were larger babies and the time to closure with the uh, with the paracetamol, it was uh, quicker as compared to the placebo. As you can see, the 50th is much sooner for the uh, paracetamol as <coughs> So there is a quicker closure and hence paracetamol, uh, although not for uh, use from the large trials as the safety data is not there, it is also effective. Symptomatic PDA, I think number of trials have been done on, on this and uh, treatment is based on the clinical or echocardiography evidence. Thresholds for treatment, they do vary between units and uncertainty of benefit of drug treatment has been a large cause. Uh, I'm not put a question, but I just wanted to have a feel from you. Uh, how many of you at the moment uh, uh, routinely treat a symptomatic PDA? Can I just have a show of hands? Right, so there are only few people who are at the moment uh, uh, going for the treatment of symptomatic <coughs> PDA, uh, very, very, very. And should the baby be treated with early symptoms of PDA or not? Now, uh, the question, this was from the Dr. Benkelari's group many years ago. So what it means is babies who are presenting with the PDA symptoms, very mild symptoms in the day three to five or, or so, and those who are left on it and treated later by about two weeks of age, is there a difference? So what they did was, this is a double blind controlled trial with the early treatment, which is uh, uh, early on in the you know, five to seven days, and the expected management, which is later on. Uh, gestation age, 23 32 weeks, 501 to 50 grams. Echo was done for a subtle PDA symptoms for metabolic acidosis, murmur, mounting pulses. If it was there, the early group received a treatment at a median of three days, and the expectant group was not treated at this time, but if they presented with symptoms, then they were treated later on. So that is 20% of them, they received ibuprofen at a median of 11 days. And 49% of expected infants never required treatment. There were no differences in the outcomes. And what the authors concluded was that infants with the mild signs of PDA, if they are already presenting it, they do not benefit from early PDA treatment as compared to the late treatment. So the, that is one answer from this trial. There's another trial at the moment uh, recruiting. It is called the PDA tolerate trial. It is run by Dr. Ron Kleiman from California. And it is a smaller number of uh, uh, babies, but a well-designed trial. Hopefully the results will be out in the next about two years time. 
So the fourth approach is the early selective treatment, and this is basically dependent on um, whether the PDA is not symptomatic with treat before that. It is very promising, but it requires an echo to be done on the unit. And there is more evidence required, and we'll talk a bit more about it. So it is prophylactic treatment without exposing babies unnecessarily who do not require the treatment. So if the baby is there who is born and the duct is not meeting, uh, is not symptomatic, uh, is not having echocardiographic hemodynamic significance, then we don't have to treat that duct. But if the baby has a large duct and it is not even symptomatic, that is the early targeted treatment. So on the early targeted treatment, there is the trial which uh, uh, the duct, the detect trial that was from Australia. It was done, it used intermethacin. It was a double blind trial. They did the echo in the first 12 hours and used intermethacin in this one uh, against the placebo. The primary outcome was death or abnormal cranial ultrasound. The interesting finding from this study was that uh, it had to be stopped early because the drug was not available. And they screened about 157 infants. And uh, in three sites, 94 infants recruited. There was no difference between the primary in the primary outcome between the two groups. But if you look at the contamination, the open label treatment was up to 40% in the control arm. So you can't make any 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 judgment or, or decision. One, the trial was stopped early, and second, there's a large contamination because they did not have any well-defined criteria, as far as I know, uh, uh, about when, when which babies to be treated for that. So. We have talked about the, the various treatment approaches. Now the third question comes is how to treat a PDA. So if we, if we talk about how to treat a PDA, in our uh, armory we have the cyclooxygenase inhibitors, which is ibuprofen or indomethacin, or the paracetamol, which works on the hydroperoxide, uh, you know, and, and then it inhibits the peroxidase, and hence conversion from PDG2 to H2, and the prostaglandin synthesis is strong. So these are the drugs available. But if you look at the comparison of these drugs, this is the one medical treatment of symptomatic duct. Should we use ibuprofen or indomethacin? It includes the IV and oral forms. The only difference coming here is for two, the necrotizing enterocolitis. It is significantly less with ibuprofen as compared to indomethacin. And the duration of ventilation is also in favor of ibuprofen as compared to indomethacin. Now, uh, I, I must believe, uh, uh, or rather say, that fortunately in the last uh, a few years, uh, we do not have endomethacin, but even if it was available, I think the preferred drug clearly now is ibuprofen for the symptomatic treatment of it, of a duct, or otherwise because of the better side effect profile. Paracetamol for the treatment of duct, the standard dose of paracetamol, there's a question up there. The standard dose of paracetamol for PDA closure is 7.5 milligram uh, for kg 6 hour It is better than ibuprofen. Paracetamol is, has a good safety profile. And the paracetamol is effective for closure of symptomatic PDA. We are talking about symptomatic PDA here. Which of the above statements is true? Very interesting answer. Okay, right. So there's still some second thoughts coming in there. Wow. <laughs> now this is biased. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's if if you take it from here, the the majority uh, uh, obviously said that uh, the PDA uh, is the, oh it's here. Right. Paracetamol has good safety profile. Fifty percent said and uh, is effective in the closure of the symptomatic period, 30% said, and the standard dose is 7.5 milligram per kg 6 hour day. Now, just a word on the safety profile. Paracetamol at the moment cannot be recommended for use because it has not been very well studied, and I'm going to just a couple of data on that. Uh, there are concerns about the long-term outcome, including autism, with the use of the paracetamol, and hence it is not been suggested. The dose of the paracetamol uh, has been quite variable in the trials. 
it has been used as much as 30 mg per kg and people who have used most uh, widely the dose has been 15 mg per kg 6 hourly. The duration has been 3 days to 7 days quite variable. Right? Its efficacy, we'll talk about the efficacy a bit and the, um, the, 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 the uh, paracetamol is effective approach of symptomatic PDA, yes, that is true. And I'm going to uh, you know, present some in, in interesting observation which was, which I think uh, would interest you. Now this is the two randomized trials only so far, which have been done using the uh, paracetamol, which is a comparison of ibuprofen with the paracetamol, right? Uh, and the, the dying and the onset, the two trials, they have, if you look at the composite analysis, it is not significant, it is right at the margin of. So there is no difference in the RCTs between paracetamol and um, ibuprofen. Now this is very interesting because uh, talking to a number of clinicians, uh, the belief is if the ibuprofen has not worked, paracetamol works. But this is a fantastic study which is very small but very uh, useful. 30 infants, <coughs> 25 week gestation, 750 grams, right? Three groups where there was a primary contraindication for the use of ibuprofen. Second is the ibuprofen could not be completed and the paracetamol was given. And the third is the ibuprofen was completed but the duct did not close and they start, they gave paracetamol. If you look into it, when it was not given, clearly there was some reduction in the, in the duct diameter as you can see and it is not significant. But if you are in any of these two groups, there is practically no difference. So if your ibuprofen has not worked, a belief from this trial or the, the results of this trial suggest that there is no effect of paracetamol in closing the duct. However, the issues could be completely different and the issues could be different means that the uh, age of the baby, that those are the ibuprofen, etc. which we will talk about in a bit. If we talk about the, um, the additional doses of ibuprofen, should that be used? And I think this is a data a bit old, as you can see from about 10 years ago. But this compared ibuprofen and indomethacin in the first 24 hours of the use. And they used ibuprofen lysine here and indomethacin. Ductal closure rate was 88% and the uh, efficacy of both the drugs was comparable. If you look at the outcomes, it is interesting that after one dose, about 53% of the drugs closed in both groups. Second dose, another 16 to 18%. Third dose under five percent, and you continue further uh, beyond three doses, you can get an advantage of, of about uh, twelve to thirteen percent extra. So that by the time the uh, six doses are given, there was about eighty-eight percent closure. So what it is suggesting is that rather than a three-day course, if you are prolonging the period of ibuprofen, it can close extra about ten to fifteen percent of the drugs. Uh, high dose regime. Now this is a data whether we should be using the dose of ten five five or 2010-10. And uh, clearly the, the, the drug monograph or SMPC does not allow uh, giving the ibuprofen at a higher dose at the moment. So you can only give 1055. But for the symptomatic duct, it has been suggested that by the, as the baby age advances, probably the ibuprofen dose may not be enough of 1055. But there are not enough data on that. The only data is that there were 70 infants uh, with the echo diagnosis uh, 1055 versus 2010, they did it despite it was not, so it was part of the uh, research protocol. Second high dose course was given if they uh, failed to close the, uh, the, the duct. Closure rate was 63% standard dose, 86% in the high dose, which was significant. There was no adverse effects. So this is something for consideration in the future that the dose if we are giving is that enough or we need to revisit the issue of appropriate dosing and I think it requires some pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic data before the, uh, the, the, the doses can be revisited and changed. Another question comes about the oral ibuprofen versus IV ibuprofen. Now, in the UK, I'm not aware of anyone who is using uh, oral ibuprofen because we're not, only IV ibuprofen is used. Uh, these are the four studies which are mainly uh, from Armenia and Turkey. Uh, this on except for the study which is uh, uh, in 2012, this included babies who were extreme preterm. All other studies they have included uh, a very low birth weight babies that means up to 32, 34 weeks. Mm -hmm. What the study I'm you know showing here is the largest of all. It is a Goldman study. We compared the oral and IV prospective randomized trial in 100 infants. Uh, we treated the uh, duct at 40 to 96 hours. Used IV, which is PDR or uh, oral ibuprofen dose standard 1055 duct closure rate they found significantly higher than the oral but mind you 
these are the babies which are slightly different from the population uh, uh, because of the geography and also it has included much larger babies which are the very low birth weight babies which many of them we don't tend to treat at times. So that brings us to the question, should we treat the ducks or not? And I think the, the question has to be uh, visited in the light of that is a symptomatic PDA, let's talk about to treat or not to treat. There are uncertainty of treatment benefits and the side effect of drug and the treatment failures. Now this is what has been creating some anxiety amongst us. Benefits of the closure of duct, but has it changed the morbidity? We don't know. And if you look at the trials which have been done in the, uh, for the treatment, there are a number of trials and if you look at the um, contamination in these trials, the control arm, that is the placebo arm, it received anywhere from 30 to 85 percent. So essentially, both the groups received the treatment and still we are believing that the control arm uh, was fine because we didn't treat the babies and, 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 and hence uh, we can't draw the conclusions. But almost 50% uh, of them, they, they, they have received the treatment. So what is the clinical duct when we are concerned about? So clearly we all know uh, we practice on the inability to wean on the ventilator. The baby is ventilated, we are not able to wean the oxygen, pressures are going up or there are signs of the large PDA like hypotension, hemorrhage, or cardiac failure, or a hyperdynamic circulation, which is more so clinical finding. So we talk about prophylactic treatment. <coughs> the benefits are it closes the duct, reduction in the IVH, but with endometriosis, which is not available in Europe, and the less symptomatic PDA. But the limitations are, if we close the duct prophylactically, we are unnecessarily treating and exposing them to the side effects of the COX inhibitors in a large proportion. And we are not screening these and uh, there have been cases where people have given the prophylactic treatment and there was a duct-dependent lesion and the baby had to be rushed to the cardiac center. So it does not co count without a cost, though in the TIP trial there was no adverse event reported. Now we do not know whether they look for it, or, uh, 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 but in, in the manuscript it has not been suggested. So we are probably moving towards precision medicine. And when I call precision medicine, although it's uh, uh, the, the North American word, but uh, yeah, we are getting to individualized medicine rather than generalizing it. So we have to select the babies where we need to target the treatment. We have to find the window of treatment because where we can treat and, and minimize the morbidity. So one of the ways is in, for the babies in the duct, the babies who are extreme preterm look uh, as if they would be the right uh, uh, gestation to, to be picked up. Echo can be widely integrated into the care to uh, diagnose a duct. We are not having time to discuss the other biomarkers like the BNP and pro-BNP and NIRS, but they still are experimental. And when to treat, uh, I think it is more appropriate, you all would agree, that uh, from the Sandbox study it is very clear that the duct is present on day three. We have already set the scene for morbidity because it increases the BPD, it increases the neck, death and everything. So probably before it becomes symptomatic, we might be choosing our babies. When we said about extreme preterm babies, these are the extreme low birth weight babies. And if you see between these two cohorts, babies who are over 1000 grams, the majority or other, all of them, they close the ducts by the time they are two months of age, with a median closure time of about day seven. But if you look at the babies who are below 1000 grams, 40% don't even close the duct by the time they are four months old. And their median closure time is almost two months. So we are exposing the babies for at least two months to the side effects, at least 50% of babies, to the side effects of the duct. So, I think this is a group which I believe we, we need to pick up extreme low birth weight or extreme low gestation babies rather than the bigger babies because they have been in, in the problem in the past less so in now because we are managing them more non-invasively. So the question comes is about the echocardiography diagnosis of the duct. And I think uh, it is a difficult one because the, uh, uh, there have been some fallacies because not just seeing a duct is important but we need to have a clear criteria. Now, if we have to go for the echo diagnosis, which of the above echo uh, diagnosis is, uh, is false? Duct diameter and color doctor more than one. Duct flow to uh, is pulsatile pattern, which is maximum to minimum velocity of more than two. Normal left ventricular cardiac output and forward flow in the descending aorta and the diastole. So which one of these echo criteria is false? I'm not expecting you all. Uh, uh, can I just have a show of hands who does the echoes or have access to echoes? Okay, so there are a few. So, um, uh, they, 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 even if uh, the, um, only few those who are doing the echo, you, they, you respond, that is fine. Because uh, I, I would not expect from others. Okay. 
So from right. So from the uh, the discourse. Okay, you want to there's some yeah coming. In. Excellent. Very nice. Okay, so 12 people respond, 13 now. Um, uh, <laughs> 17, great. Okay. Right, so um, uh, the, the topmost uh, are the ductal flow, versatile flow pattern, normal left ventricular cardiac output, duct diameter of one, and the forward for the descending aorta. The question was which one is false, right? Uh, or did you, did, did you click all of them which are correct? <laughs> because the question was what was false. So let me just uh, tell you the question about it. It is, it is normal, uh, or rather minimum duct diameter, what one should know uh, uh, for cutoff is 1.5. Anything below 1.5 on the duct dimension is not a large PDA. The, in any trial, in any clinical setting, unless the duct dimension is 1.5, anything below 1.5 is not a significant duct. Flow pattern, Pulsatile is important because that denotes that there is a gradient and that is taken as a significant finding. Left ventricular cardiac output, it can be normal. It, it, it does not necessarily uh, have to be abnormal because if your cardiac function is not uh, good, you still can have a normal cardiac output with a large PDA. So the cardiac output will be increased as you would expect if the cardiac function is normal. But if the cardiac function is compromised, then your cardiac output can be normal. And the forward for the descending aorta is normal, either it is an absent or a reversal that makes it a significant duct. So because it is, uh, we are not going to talk about uh, any of the echoes, we will just move forward. But those of you interested, I think we can divide the echo diagnosis into three categories, duct characteristics, hyperperfusion, and a hypoperfusion. So if you look at duct characteristics, size of duct more than 1.5 at least, or symptomatic ducts can be more than two, some people take that. Flow pattern, we have said about pulsatile flow pattern. Left heart size, normally there can be dilatation of the left heart size, LV function is important to assess because that can uh, lead to your diagnosis. And the <coughs> uh, post-ductal flow pattern in the aorta of the mesenteric artery, it is important, either it is a reversal or absent end diastolic flow. So this is just showing you the ductal characteristics. Uh, uh, these are the, it's, that's a small duct, a large duct, that's the closing PDA pattern, that's the pulsatile flowing pattern, it's a transitional growing pattern. Those of you interested about being more objective, the, 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 these criteria have been there. This was from Patrick's uh, long time ago, but that is quite detailed. This is from Afif from Ireland, uh, and, and this is um, having a good uh, predictive value, and it says the ROC uh, curve is about over 0.9. So good sensitivity, and they suggest that uh, doing a gestation in weeks using this formula with a PDA diameter, cardiac output, uh, PDA velocity, and the uh, TDI A wave. If you can, if somebody is there on your unit to do this, it is said to be having a good predictive value. But clinical criteria always remain there, and these are the other uh, findings which are uh, of interest. Before I finish, uh, based on the precision medicine, there are a few trials which are at the moment going on. There is uh, uh, one uh, trial from France, which is a triocapi trial. The second is uh, 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 from uh, Netherlands. It is the Benedictus trial. And the third one, which we have been funded for doing uh, in UK uh, and in Ireland, we are doing it across about 35 sites uh, with a sample size of about 730 extreme preterm babies. So the criteria are extreme preterm babies who are less than 72 hours old, dimension more than 1.5, pulsatile flow. And if the clinician is uncertain, we rule out any other uh, duct dependent lesions, randomized to receive ibuprofen, PDR, which is 1055 or a placebo, this is blinded trial, so it has come as a trial uh, uh, IMP. And the primary outcome for the trial is um, uh, either a composite of death or uh, moderate to severe PPT at 36 weeks. And there are a number of secondary outcomes, which includes complications of prematurity. We are looking at the long-term outcome at two years and the respiratory outcomes at two years and the health economic evaluation. We would hopefully, if the, uh, if the, the trial is including at the moment and uh, the funding for even longer to follow is planned. So 730 babies, uh, and hopefully uh, when we complete in the next year and a half, we should have some direction of uh, going further. So in summary, uh, PDA is not benign, and it increases the risk of death and complications of prematurity. Late treatment of duct does not improve clinical and long-term outcomes. 
Early target treatment approach seems promising, but as you know, the trials are underway and we might get some direction from there. Oral ibuprofen is effective in closing PDA from the uh, four trials, with, they were including larger babies. Additional doses of ibuprofen can increase the closure rate or a repeat courses. Paracetamol seems to close PDA, but data is required on safety and health outcomes. So with that, I would like to close and um, I would like to invite you to, uh, the, if you're having a desire about the duck, we have a two-day meeting organized in October. The flyers are outside, so uh, please do visit. Thank you very much.